since the middle of August. So is this the start of a correction? And if so, how should you position? Jason Pride is Chief of Investment Strategy and Research at Glenn Mead. Jason, welcome. It is good to have you with us. So uh, is this the me. start of the fall correction that so many people have been predicting for weeks? Look, I don't know if this is the exact start of, of the fall correction, but what I can say is that this market has been surprisingly strong this year in face of a difficult economic environment. You know, there have been a lot of built up hopes here for a soft landing, and there's been a lot of excitement that is now snuck in uh, in relation to artificial intelligence, this generative AI. Um, you know, there's some reason to both of those occurring, but at the end, uh, we think that investors will probably end up coming back to a little bit more reasonable of a basis, recognizing that even though we we may or may not have a recession here, we think our odds are still probably still more likely a recession. But even without one, this is not a robust growth period. And artificial intelligence, look, it's probably a big deal, but it's probably not going to be something that shows up in bottom lines for the economy and for the average company very near term. It's something that's a longer term outcome. So we suspect that investors will probably eventually end up a little bit disappointed and probably settling out at lower valuation talk, levels. Talk to us a little bit about what you see in corporate earnings. Um, whether we have a recession or not, the earnings picture has been sort of spotty at best. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a, that's a great way to put it, right? So uh, every earnings report season, our vast majority of them we see, we see companies beat expectations, and that makes it feel good. But then when you look back at the numbers, you realize we've had three quarters in a row of negative earnings growth in the midst of a fairly kind of borderline economic environment. This is a situation where companies are, are having a hard time squeezing out that next rung of true profit growth uh, at this point in time. And because of that, valuations this year with the market's run have actually expanded. Multiples have expanded and fundamentals haven't really pro progressed all that much. I, I don't mean to sound crotchety, but I always look at, at the, oh, they are, we beat expectations as a really helpful tool for traders. But the real measure is whether earnings are growing or not. That's the helpful tool for investors. Completely agree. And look, you know, it's, it's easy to reset those expectations low and then come in ahead of it. Um, what we do tend to like to see is rising expectations and then beats on top of it. This this pairing them back and then barely beating them doesn't really you know, hit us as a that good of an environment to be in. So, Jason, where do we go if you say to people, OK, well, your options are, you know, you can go to treasuries. You can you know, you cannot be in the market at all. You can stay in it and just kind of ride this out. What are your expectations uh, into the end of the year then? Sure. So we think we're probably going to have a sluggish market going into the end of the year. And because of that, and I'm thinking more about the large capitalization marketplace where most of the overvaluation uh, sits. As a result of that, what you can do is you can take three different approaches. Number one, you can just generally with your asset allocation, be a little bit more defensive, choose to have a little bit more in fixed income and a little bit less in equities. You happen to be collecting 5% so uh, interest rates in, uh, in fixed income, which actually feels pretty good in the face of an overvalued equity market. You can also tilt within within uh, large cap or within the domestic marketplace, either smaller capitalization or into more defensive sectors. So healthcare, consumer staples, utilities at this point in time. And the third thing you can do is actually tilt internationally. Uh, we tend to think that Japan is a very interesting opportunity, one that's benefiting from the inflationary environment and actually started a much lower valuation spot. It's, it's having a gangbuster year this year, and we think there's perhaps still a little bit more upside left on the table. Why have defensive stocks uh, been sort of in, the, in, a, in a holding pattern with all of the sort of economic slowdown talk? You would think they would be doing better than they have. I think it comes down to the back and forth on this economic talk. You know, we've we've had a period here where people have actually gotten to the point where they almost expect that soft landing to occur. I think maybe the odds of it have come up a little bit, and that takes some of the luster off of defensive stocks within the broader equity marketplace. Mm -hmm. um, as you look at it today, though, with the market backing off, uh, you are seeing those sectors that are more defensive in nature actually outperforming today.